Good morning and happy Sabbath, every one of you. And it's a, it's a privilege and honor to be able to share God's word um, and his message this morning. And so I know we've already prayed once before, but I'd like to just invite us to pray one more time before we begin the message. If you bow your heads with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask and we pray and we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to have access to your word, that we can study it for ourselves, and that amazing thought that we can commune with you, the creator of heaven and earth, through prayer and through study of your word. We ask, Lord, that it would be you that is supplying the message to our understanding this morning as we uh, just dwell on great and high concepts from your word. May it be seen that Jesus Christ is high and lifted up, and may, may we each behold him in a new and uh, maybe more intense and lasting way this morning because of the time we spent with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you may have noticed that the, uh, the sermon title, it's always a challenge to come up with a fitting title for the message that God has kind of impressed to our minds, but uh, our title this morning is A Faith That Shines. And, um, and starting out, you know, what is faith? Faith is definitely an essential part of the Christian life, I think we can say each one of us is here because of exercising our faith in what we know of God, exercising our faith in God's word and in the beauty that we see of his character shown forth. So it's kind of hard to describe what faith is, but any, um, maybe throw out some, some other synonyms of faith that you might um, think of. Any words that come to your mind? Trust, I think I heard trust somewhere back there. So trust, uh, that's very good. And another one? Confidence, very good. Assurance, I think all those are excellent choices for sentiments for faith. Um, I think when we look at our definition in, in the Bible, Oftentimes we go to a very familiar passage in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. It's called the hall. Another word for that description of that, that chapter is the hall of faith. And there have been many sermons preached upon that. That's not the, uh, the definite object for our sermon this, or message this morning, going through Hebrews 11 in detail. But just to look at the Bible definition of what faith is. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And we believe that Paul is the author of Hebrews. And he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And he goes on saying, for by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then he starts into his description of these great champions of faith throughout the Bible and how faith enabled them to do amazing things. And going down to verse 6, we see this interlude. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I like this encapsulation of what faith is. Um, you know, the writings of Paul are, are quite deep and immense, and he was given the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write these things down for our admonition. But does that give you an understanding of what faith is, that description? I think in, in some essence, belief was in there. And if you look at the uh, original Hebrew words for, for faith, it's interesting that the word actual, the word faith, on its own, is only listed a couple of times in the Old Testament. You see many more times where it's faithful or faithfulness or things like that, but it all comes down to the root word, and it's very, very similar. Um, and also the, the Greek uh, contemporary to that is very similar to the word belief. Uh, probably what's, what's the most famous verse that maybe all of us and maybe all of Christendom would, would know by heart, perhaps, John 3.16. And then when you come to believe or believeth, it's the same root word 
of faith uh, rich in the rest of the, the New Testament. So they're very synonymous. And when you look at more descriptions of those root words, you get those synonyms of uh, one that I really like is constant reliance, constant reliance upon or trust. Um, and it's interesting, Jesus also, because he knew that faith was so essential, we have to believe that God is. That, and I like to think, just as it was described, that we know that the, everything we see around us in nature and in the heavens was made by the word of God. He spoke it into existence, and he didn't use things he had already kind of formed or fashioned, he spoke and everything appeared. That's the God we serve, infinitely powerful. And so knowing this, that God is able to bring about something from nothing, something amazing from something that maybe didn't even exist beforehand by his word. So our faith is intimately tied into believing God's word and not believing our own senses, our own sight, hearing. And so all of those individuals that are listed demonstrated that faith at some point in their lives. You know, this is a true account. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat anyone's experience. It doesn't gloss over defects of character. It brings that out because we're all in the same situation of needing God's grace and mercy and the working of the Holy Spirit to change our characters, change those defects so that we can become more and more like our Savior, whom we are to behold. And so I'm thankful that it gives these accounts, but you know this, I think Hebrews chapter 11 is really, it's an unfinished chapter in the sense that God is looking to each one of us as professed followers of Jesus Christ to be, become part of this hall of faith. Like, and if we look back, by God's grace, each and every one of us will be saved into his kingdom and bring as many as we can with us. We'll look back, every one of us in that redeemed state will have experienced this faith experience. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is essential for that. And so this concept of faith that shines, you know, I was um, just impressed by some things I was reading about some certain examples of that. And so I think it's, it's a powerful testimony, maybe more so than speaking up here and giving sermons or speaking words to those that you meet out in the community, a life that is lived by constant reliance upon God, trusting in him. A life of faith has more power for the gospel than a million sermons. Do you agree with that? Because it, it's an example of all that, uh, that who Jesus Christ is. His desire is for his character to be demonstrated in his people. And that's what the gospel is all about, taking us from rebels on this quarantine planet. We're still talking about quarantine over a year into this, but we are quarantined from, because of sin, but God's chosen to come and show us in a clear demonstration who he is, he's a God of love, and say so he's going to redeem us. That's just the amazing miracle of the gospel. Who would then would be your um, person that when you think of someone faithful above other examples, who would you think, who are some characters you would think of? And they're, they're listed in Hebrews 11, but just curious who you would name. Noah, Job, Daniel. The three worthies. Excellent, excellent examples as well. Abraham. You know, he's uh, described as faithful Abraham. And it's amazing that he wasn't always in that situation with his character. He was had character defects just like each one of us might struggle with. He was tempted to doubt, maybe, that God would see him through certain situations when things looked to be in trouble. But through that, God was able to, to use him. And it's amazing, and, and just thinking about Abraham, how when he was given the promise to both he and, and Sarah that a child would be born, a child to promise, even in their old age, the time seemed to tarry, but eventually we're told that he believed in this one encounter when God told him to go outside of his tent, look up at the stars, and somehow beholding the infinite number of stars that he couldn't count, he realized that the one who spoke these into existence is able to produce this miracle of this child being born. So he believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And because of that, as the years rolled by, that Isaac was born, this child of promise, this miracle, eventually we have this ultimate example of 
to one uh, of the human family coming as close as can be in that situation to experiencing maybe what God the Father experienced in allowing his son to die upon the cross. Look at that example of faith, because he was faithful. He believed. And we're even told further on in Hebrews 11 that he believed that even if God had him go through with that sacrifice of Isaac, that he was well able to raise him up again to fulfill his promise. One example that I, I'm thinking of that's also listed in here that maybe we didn't, it wasn't mentioned, is the example of Moses. You might not think, we think of Moses as being meek above all men upon the earth, meaning that he was not maybe first to stand up for his, his, own, um, his own self. He was thinking upon others first and ultimately humble and surrendered to God. But God took some time to get him to that state. He was in the wilderness for how many years? The first time, I mean, in the country setting, tending the sheep, a fitting preparation that God had for him to lead his people, this innumerable flock of, of persons that uh, was to be God's heritage and lead them to the promised land. So he learned that patient reliance, constant reliance upon God, and reflecting upon his word. You know, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write the first five books of the Bible during that experience. And so his, his experience of, of faith, of constant reliance, of trust, I'm sure was spent with times of sincere prayer, meditation upon God, thinking upon him and his goodness and mercy. So all of that goes along with a life of faith. I want to key in on this aspect uh, as we're talking about a faith that shines. We know that um, God performed mighty, wonderful works and wonders in leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. We all know those accounts. It's definitely good to, to remember those. And I just found, if you want a succinct uh, chronology of the history of Israel, look at Acts chapter 7. And Stephen, one of the uh, early deacons, filled with the Holy Spirit, gave this perfect example of the chronology of that. So you can read that as your ledger. We'll kind of touch on that in just a moment as well on certain aspects of that. But God had brought his people, used Moses to be the, the visible manifestation of his leading, um, so the people could look to that leader, but the ultimate leader was, was Jesus Christ and leading them. And so ultimately they come to an area in the wilderness, and we know the story. You know, God calls Moses to come up to the mount, the Mount Sinai, and he's there for a long time. He's there for how many days and nights? Forty days and nights. And did he eat or drink anything? He was sustained by God being in God's presence. He wasn't even thinking about those physical needs. But of course that communion was broken up by something unexpected. What was that? Sound of, sound of music and, and the people totally losing sight of who it was that had led them and guided them all that way. And so we have the, the golden calf experience. And so that communion that Moses had with God was broken up temporarily uh, by that. And we see that experience here. And going back to Exodus, we're going to key on this aspect of Moses' experience and relationship with God. We see in uh, Exodus chapter 32, and we'll start in verse 30. This is after Moses had come down from the mount. He saw the children of Israel totally giving themselves up to idolatry. And, and unfortunately, his brother Aaron, who was supposed to have known better and to be the, the voice of reason, had, had kind of given into that. So um, I'm thankful as, as uh, I am... I have a fellow, a namesake in my first name that God ultimately was able to redeem Aaron um, and he wasn't cast away because of this terrible, terrible, uh, this judgment and sin. But Moses had taken a stand. He had called the people to step over the line. Whoever's on the Lord's side, come before him. And so there was a swift judgment upon the people because of this great sin. And then God gives instruction to Moses 
and verse 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye, ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gold, gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book of life, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore, now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So, of course, there was consequences to this sin. But you see, Moses had been communing, I'm sure, well before this time in the mount with God and the time that he was tending the flocks of his father-in-law. So he had this relationship and understanding. But even more so, seeing God, being in God's presence, as close as any human could be, you see manifest a certain character. Did Moses, I mean, God offered maybe him a pretty good deal. Let me just blot out this people. I'll start a new nation with you. But no, he, he intercedes for the people, just as Jesus Christ is our intercessor. And he said, if it be not possible for you to forgive their sin, just blot me out of the book of life so that they may live. So we might see that a life of genuine faith, constant reliance upon God, is one that's going to be, we're going to be having experiences, communion with God, and that's going to be in the secret place of prayer, through studying his word, meditating upon him, and the more we spend time, that's how we can be in God's presence, because unfortunately, until sin, our sins are blotted away no more, we cannot be in God's physical presence. We'd be consumed by his, his holiness. Sin cannot abide in God's presence, so God, in his mercy, is giving us every provision for the sin to be taken out of our lives, if we'll just allow him to do so. And so, going into chapter 33 of Exodus, um, you know, God gives further instructions to Moses, and um, of course Moses is writing these things down. And Moses gets, we might call it boldness, but maybe because he, he had such communion with God that he was able to ask him, this seemingly bold question. In verse 18, Moses says to the Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. And of course, as I alluded, that you know, sin cannot abide God's presence. Going back to the beginning, before sin entered in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were able to walk and talk with God in the garden. They were able to see him face to face, but that had not happened since sin entered in. So Moses is asking this bold question, show me thy glory. And it's interesting that the Lord didn't strike him down there for asking this question. He almost reasons with him in verse 19 onward. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So such a close community had Moses with the Lord that the Lord was granting this extraordinary experience of seeing whatever part of God's glory could be seen. But I find it very important and interesting that the Bible makes mention, you know, the Lord did agree to this request um, in a certain way, but he says that in addition to making all his goodness pass before thee, he will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And so this was actually, it seems in the context, this was spoken while Moses had gone into the tabernacle uh, to commune with the Lord. This was, um, you know, after the, the golden calf experience, 
and Moses is, is talking with God at the tabernacle. And so it seems like on the, the next day it was that Moses was told to go up again into the Mount, to Mount Sinai on the top, and that's where God would reveal his, his glory or show his goodness. He also gave instruction for Moses to cut out two tables of stone again. These are replacement ones after the first were, uh, were thrown down and, and broke, symbolizing Israel's breaking of the covenant that they had just proclaimed verbally. So Exodus chapter 34, and verse 5, we pick it up here. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, standing with Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. It's interesting, if you look at the uh, account of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses earlier, there's a similar language there um, as far as you know, not clearing uh, the, uh, uh, by no means clear the guilty. So those who willingly sin against God and do not repent will not receive that mercy. When the, God's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, he d- closes it by in keeping, in giving sorry, mercy to thousands of them that, lovely, that love me and keep my commandments. So it's an interesting uh, parallel there. So what is my point in all this? For one, God said that he would show his goodness. Moses asked to see God's glory. What was he given? Primarily, God proclaimed his name. And what's another word that we can think of for his name in the description that was given? He described his character, didn't he? Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. So did Moses see God's glory? He did. He was given the true glory of God. The Bible could have written that Moses, uh, and God showed him his magnificent brilliance and, and brightness, and Moses fell down on his face and couldn't see, or things like that could have been described. And I'm sure we can have no concept what that visually would have looked like. But the important thing is God showed to Moses, he proclaimed his character. That is God's true glory. If, if I may go as far as to, to, to make that... Uh, proclamation there. God's glory, not so much as his omnipotence, omnipresence, which is all encompasses who he is, and we can't fathom that, but his ultimate glory is his character, and that can be boiled down to a character of love. And that character was made manifest supremely when Jesus Christ came to this earth to show us the Father. Jesus himself we're done with, uh, with Moses here for, for that experience, but the interesting thing, that, and why I picked this sermon title of Faith That Shines, what happened when Moses came off the mountain after he had communed with God in that time? His face was glowing and shining so much that people couldn't even look at him. They said, Moses, please put a veil on your face. Is it possible for us to have that communion with God that our faces can be shining? It has happened other places in the Bible. But I would say the majority of times when we shine, it's going to be in shining forth God's character. Just as he described it, it's very mercy, grace, being long-suffering. And there's other, other lists that go along with this. Think of the fruit of the Spirit. All these things are possible only because of God's dwelling in our lives through the Holy Spirit so that Christ is seen in what we say, what we do, so that he is ultimately glorified. Jesus said in John 15, if you turn there with me, this is a familiar concept when he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And so, just think of that concept. I mean, I don't know how many of you, I think many of you are very good green thumbs in the garden, and um, you're able to take care of the plants, and they are flourishing. Um, some of us are, are, are learning as we go about that, but I, I just asked the question in the, the youth Sabbath school this morning, what would happen if you, you know, cut a branch off of your whatever plant that might be, a tomato plant, 
and you come back the next day, is that tomato plant going to be nice, green, and, and flourishing? What's going to happen to it? It wither. It's going to be dead because it's not receiving life from the parent stock. So likewise, that's Jesus. And thankfully, he was talking to us in these parables we can understand because many times we, our understanding is, is quite dull. And um, Jesus said, in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, or the, you could say the gardener. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. And I'd like to go down further here. So that abiding principle is that the key and the only way that we can show forth God's love to others. Uh, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. And what is that? Greater love? That a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. And this abiding, again, it's... Uh, other words, if you look at the, the root word, is constant, remaining, not departing. So I think we understand that we can only bear fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, because these are fulfilling of the law of liberty. And I think we each want to be fruitful Christians for the Lord. And talking of that uh, bearing fruit... Um, so as I said, majority of time, Jesus calls us to be lights in the world, to shine forth for him. And um, if you look to uh, Paul's account, kind of recounting what happened to Moses as his face was shining, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. There, sorry for the delay. And this is summarizing. He was beforehand going through the recounting how, just as Moses had to put a veil on his face uh, for the brightness that people couldn't stand, he was using that as an allegory of how the majority of Israel at that time just would not accept the the new covenant experience. And how God intended to change them from the inside out, give them new hearts and minds, write his law upon their hearts and minds. But in verse 18 we see, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a, a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we can behold Jesus Christ unveiled through studying his word, through meditating upon his goodness and mercy, his character, and by communing with him through prayer. And you know, I'm thankful for the 40 Days of Prayer initiative as kind of a catalyst to get us to seek the Lord more earnestly than ever before. And, um, and we're all learning, you know, how to cultivate that, that prayer life. And something I had read this week um, in a different, different book um, made me think about some things. So you know, oftentimes we might think of prayer as more of a time that we're going to inform God about our certain situation, uh, give him an update as if he didn't already know everything about us and what we're going through. But sometimes that it might tend to be like that. We might give a monologue, a prayer, and then maybe end it with an amen and, and not have time to quietly wait for God to reply, maybe by inspiring us with a certain verse in his word or giving a certain thought. So... God wants 
to have communion, which means it's a two-way conversation. And that can be uh, continuing through the day as you meditate upon it, you think upon God's character. He can talk to us. And so I think we definitely shortchange ourselves and limit God's work in our lives when we approach prayer in that way. And so may God help us to truly appropriate prayer because we're given other inspired um, descriptions of prayer. Like prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse. So both are absolutely essential. Um, other verses I thought of sharing here, and we have, probably don't have time, is in Colossians where it talks about the mystery of God being accomplished and the mystery is Christ, Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is kind of a summarizing of the fulfillment of the gospel in our lives, that Jesus Christ is manifest, that he is living out through us as we're abiding in him. So I mentioned uh, Stephen, you see in Acts chapter 7, and I'm just keying on him as we're talking about this kind of shining part. It was an interesting description. You know, he was brought before the Jewish leaders at that time to give an answer to why he was preaching Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the Son of God, and so he had to give an account of that. And um, let me get there. Uh, it's actually, the end of chapter 6 talks about when he was about to speak and give his uh, testimony. Uh, Acts 6.15, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So the Bible doesn't say he was shining, but you're going to get this idea because he evidently had this communion with God such that he was unwavered by standing up in front of the the leaders, this high council, to give an account of why he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was unfazed by that. His face was like that of an angel. You can imagine it was, it was shining there. And, and then he gives this amazing recount of Israel's history and, and summarizing and his culmination, just not mincing any words and just telling the, the Jewish leaders that they have rejected God's true light that they have crucified the Savior. And that was more than enough that the leaders sought to put him to death, and they stoned Stephen. But what happened when Stephen was, even before he had finally given up his life, what was his attitude? Was he uh, cursing the people and, um, you know, seeing all these things against them? What was his attitude? You know, we, exactly, before he said that, this is in uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, 55 through 57, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, and it's only possible through the Holy Spirit indwelling that he could do this. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. So he saw the glory of God too. So I can imagine his face was lighted up during this time. And Jesus, standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. And, of course, they ultimately stoned him. The amazing thing, though, and all of this throng of people, who, who was it that was there to witness, and actually the, Stephen's cloak and everything was laid at his feet. Who was that person? Saul, who was persecuting the Christian church with a vengeance and thought he was doing God's service during this time. So he was influenced greatly by seeing this demonstration of faith that Stephen had, this faith that shines. And so he ultimately, with another experience seeing Jesus Christ firsthand on the road to Damascus, was a changed man. And uh, God's purposes went forward because of that. You know, I wanted to share a, more of a modern example, and it's a story that we're all familiar with, I think. Has anyone not heard of Desmond Doss? Is that a name that you're not familiar with, Desmond Doss? I think we've, we, we kind of speak of his uh, life of faith and amazing uh, acts of courage in the battlefield because it is such an amazing example. And of course, he, the faith that drove him was a faith in God's word implicitly. And he was 
a believer in keeping all of God's commandments. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But his uh, example, I believe, is one that he had a faith that shone. And the thing that I have, part of his story that I didn't really remember as much, we know that he, uh, when World War II broke out and the call was for men to join the, the army, join the armed forces, to fight for this, uh, this cause, um, he was, first and foremost, one of the ones who came and, and wanted to volunteer, to join, to do his duty, to serve. And there were even others in his hometown in rural Virginia who wanted to serve, but they were unfit physically for whatever reason. And they were so determined to serve. They, um, some, some people even like, uh, did drastic things in, in that situation because they weren't able to serve. They were so distraught. And, um, but his whole story, he endured ridicule because he was determined to obey all of the commandments, including thou shalt not kill. And he was classed as a conscientious objector, but he would always say, that's not who I am. I want to serve. I'm more of a conscientious cooperator. I want to save life rather than take it. And he was ridiculed to no end, day in, day out, by his fellow soldiers. Um, and perhaps it was because in the beginning, they were just maybe hearing his faith spoken, but it was only later they could see it demonstrated. But he would uh, be able to show that even in basic training. But I'll get all the way to the, when they're in the battles. You can imagine the, uh, the fighting in the Pacific was so horrendous. We can't even imagine. And I just, uh, applaud those who may have experienced that uh, and fought for our country during that time. But Time and time again, he would show his, his courage, his faith, and that faith was put into action um, time and time again on the battlefield. And we know that ultimately it was one particular battle, uh, the island of Okinawa, uh, this foreboding ridge top called Hacksaw Ridge, uh, or Maeda Escarpment, that the Lord was able to use him to, to rescue 75 of his other wounded soldiers during that time. And over a 12-hour period, this man who was maybe at most 150 pounds, kind of slightly built, the Lord enabled him to rescue one of his wounded soldiers every 10 minutes uh, during that time, if you do the math. And so it was those times, and that was not the only time that he, he had a faith that was shining, and his fellow soldiers could see. It was time and time again, all the battles leading up to that. What I really wanted to key on his story was that even though he was ridiculed, beaten, time and time again before that, they tried to court-martial him, um, he was unwavering, had steadfast confidence of, and trust in God that in the end, after that courageous display on that, that one day, and that was the day that ultimately his fellow soldiers uh, looked upon that and nominated him for the Congressional Medal of Honor, and um, but it was, he could have gotten so many more medals for all the other times. Because usually, a Medal of Honor is awarded for some amazing act of valor and bravery, maybe just in a moment of battle, but not over and over and over again. So the summary of all this is that when he finally, on that day, and this was battle raging on the Sabbath day too, it was the Sabbath, and the, all the divisions, the U.S. Army, were waiting upon this hill to be taken before they could advance further. And days before, they had uh, taken control of this ridge, and then in the evening, they would be drawn, pushed back again by the Japanese. Ultimately, the order came that that ridge had to be taken at all costs, no matter what, no turning back. And uh, before they could start this final day of battle, they were waiting on this humble um, Christian man to have his prayer time with God, the whole advance of the army was waiting upon this, this time, but that was so important. And um, we could go on and on with detail about the things that God accomplished through him. And there wasn't anything, you know, uh, extraordinary about Desmond Dawes physically or in any other way other than that he had a simple faith and trust in God. And through that, God is able to do mighty things. Imagine that at the end of of this battle. He was finally wounded pretty seriously to the point that he couldn't continue to do his medic work. 
Even when they were car- they're carrying him off the battlefield, there was another soldier who was more injured than he was, and he asked to, for that soldier to be taken off before him. Ultimately, in the, uh, the chaos of that time, he had lost what had been carrying him through that whole time. He had a pocket Bible that his wife had given him, and I think he had a picture of her within it. And at some, at some point, it got lost on the battlefield. He was taken back to the hospital ship, recovering from his wounds, and he's realized that that was missing, and he was quite distraught about that. The Bible had carried him through all this time, and so he, he let that be known that uh, maybe the word can be passed on to other soldiers who were still on the battlefield. It was still going. It had not been cleared completely. That if anyone could find that Bible and return it, he'd be so grateful. So his, his fellow soldiers, the ones who had thrown shoes at him and ridiculed him, because of the faith that they had seen demonstrated through action and willing to risk his life, lay down his life for his, his fellow soldiers, even ones that were, would be considered too far gone to save. People who had both legs blown off in the horrificness of the war, he stopped to save them. If there was life left, he, he wouldn't pass that by. And there was one individual in that situation that maybe would have been passed by as being too far gone to save, he survived and lived to the ripe age of 72 because of Desmond being willing to demonstrate his faith through love. So ultimately, his fellow soldiers would go on that battlefield risking their lives, retracing his steps, looking for that pocket Bible, the word of God that he had lost in in the fray. So the amazing thing that I see is that that life of faith, it was steadfast. He didn't waver from day to day. He was constant, and though he was ridiculed at first, ultimately his soldiers trusted in him, that if that carried him through, they would at all costs risk their lives now to go and recover that pocket Bible, and they did, they did find it, and it was brought back to him. It's an amazing story, so that just kind of made me choke up as I was thinking about that too, that what a powerful example, a life of faith, trust, constant reliance upon God, can have, not only for ourselves, but to others around us who see that and can be drawn to Jesus Christ through that. So my prayer is that God will accomplish his desire, which is to fulfill a similar experience in each one of our lives, so we can be examples to others, that we can shine. Maybe it's not shining literally, which that can happen too, but shining in our example that we're revealing the fruits of the Spirit in our daily lives. So I'd like to invite each one of you, if you want to have that experience, to live a life of faith, because the Bible says faith is the victory. I invite you to stand as we sing.